Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for, for uh, joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce a dear friend, Danny Roderick, who is the Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at Harvard's uh, JFK School of Government. Danny has a close connection to Princeton as well, having uh, done his PhD from Princeton under the famous Princeton economist Avinash Dixit. Um, and he has a new book out. He's the author of many books, so I won't go through all of his books, but he, his newest book is Straight Talk on Trade, Ideas for a Sane World Economy. Danny is uh, really one of my favorite economists. I'm not just saying that because he's sitting there. Um, it's, it's a true statement. Um, and you know, one reason why I like Danny is that he is the counterexample, perhaps, of the criticism that is often given uh, to us economists that you guys are just in your little, little bubble and you know talking about your technical minutia and un unaware of what is happening in the rest of the world so whenever someone gives you that argument you know you you just tell them about Danny Roderick so that's that's why that's why I, I like him so much his uh, his scope is really broad you know he his work has ranged talking about big issues like globalization, economic growth, political economy, um, and development, of course. Um, one quality that Danny clearly has, uh, an enviable quality, is that you cannot intimidate Danny, and you can see that in his work. Um, he's courageous in many different ways. He is um, not shy to go against the conventional wisdom, whether that conventional wisdom is held by his fellow academics or whether it's coming from you know, large institutions like the IMF or whether it's coming from his uh, country of origin, Turkey. Um, he's, very, you know, he's very clear in his thinking and that comes out um, in his courage to call a spade a spade. And I will try to give some illustrations, some examples of, of, of that courage and that independent thinking that is really the hallmark of a, of a true scholar. Before I do that, I should also mention that Danny is also different from the rest of us in that he's also a prophet. Um, he has his own Ten Commandments, and I'll, I'll, talk, about, I'll, I'll talk about those uh, at the, towards the end. Um, but let me come back to you know, just talking about Danny's um, uh, independent streak and courage that I, that I referred to. So now, these days, we are all talking about, including uh, in the presentations before, we are talking about trade and you know, some of the negative effects of trade, especially from a distributional perspective. Uh, Danny was one of the first earlier voices making that point at a time when you know, there was this big discussion and push for you know, more trade is good all the time and for everyone. Um, and, and, and Danny, at that time, I'll just sort of quote one, um, one sentence from his 1997 uh, piece where he said, there was a yawning gap between the rosy view of globalization held by economists and the gut instincts of many people. And here again, you know, he was bringing out this point that these distributional issues can be very important, and especially from this political economy perspective, which again, given Danny's background, is a, is a theme that he has come back to again and again. Um, in terms of my own work, I've also um, particularly liked Danny's early uh, foray into this question of liberalization of capital markets and financial markets, and again, Danny was one of the first to point out that credit flows and or hot money flows can potentially be destabilizing, and he provided a conceptual framework for when and why that would be the case. Uh, again, Danny was uh, ahead of the of the of the crowd on that important topic as well. Um, more recently, he has talked about the, uh, the the this sort of the diminishing return to export-oriented growth for the remaining developing countries. And again, and I think it's a, it's a question that's very important given the kind of technological progress that we are, that we are observing. Um, one could go on and on, but I'm sure you're not here to uh, uh, hear me speak, so I'll, 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 I'll give the floor to Danny shortly. But I, will, I just want to emphasize one other thing, which is that Danny is also very active in public debate. So you can follow him on Twitter, and uh, it's always engaging. Um, but I will, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to see responses to Danny on Twitter as well. So I'll just give you an example of a recent uh, comment that Danny received. So maybe I'll use this occasion, Danny, to convey that message to you. I'm sure you didn't read it. Um, so Danny was pointing out towards the lack of rule of law in Turkey, uh, which is quite apparent if you just read the news. 
and he mentioned that Turkey is kind of now at the bottom uh, of the ranking of uh, rule of law. And at that, uh, someone named Hilal, which means crescent, um, ostensibly I looked at the Twitter account and he's a very patriotic Turkish citizen, I imagine, or maybe a, a bot. Um, his, 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 response, his response to um, Danny was, You know, even the whole world knows it is a lie. That is what Danny was proposing. If you're ranking, don't add us, please. We don't need your thoughts. Did you understand? So this is an illustration of the kind of pushback that you know, uh, Danny receives in the public uh, whenever you know, he, 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 he tries to go against the conventional wisdom or, the, or, or, or those in, 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 in power. And it is my uh, privilege, really, to, to in, invite Danny to the podium. He'll talk about globalization and the populist backlash. And after his remarks, we'll open up for question and answers. Danny. Um, good afternoon, and, and um, Atip, thank you so much for, for that uh, extraordinarily um, generous introduction. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the fact is everything I know about uh, international economics I learned here, um, literally within, you know, 25 uh, yards of, of uh, um, uh, where, where, we're, uh, where we are currently. And uh, of course, it wasn't just Avinash Dixit, but also uh, Jean Grossman. I think Jean is somewhere here, um, and they they taught me everything I know. Um, and um, I, I I see um, right there my macro tutor, <laughs> um, who who uh, who. Uh, <laughs> who went down and did um, um, many other interesting things. So it, it's, it's great to be here, and, and, uh, and, I, and also you know, slightly embarrassing, actually, since I'll be regurgitating many of uh, what I learned uh, right here uh, about trade um, to, to this audience. Um, but uh, I will start with the history, because that's, I think, nicely follows from uh, last um, uh, night's dinner, uh, where uh, Doug Irwin gave this uh, fantastic uh, um, uh, tour of uh, U.S. trade policy um, and history of, of U.S. trade policy, and as he mentioned um, uh, in his in his talk, uh, the United States has a has a very long uh, populist uh, tradition, um, and uh, it's a tradition that actually has been intertwined. Uh, with globalization, with the history of globalization. Um, where do I have to point this? Or maybe not, just do this. Um, that, um, that if you look at sort of the long uh, history of globalization and the various swings of uh, the highs and, and lows of globalization, that there's been a tendency uh, of especially the uh, latter stages of uh, globalization, advanced stages of globalization to kind of create um, a, a kind of a, a, an opposition, a backlash. And in many ways, I think what we're experiencing uh, today is, uh, is, is an instance of that. And, and so uh, a lot of what I'm trying, what I want to do um, is, is talk about the basic economics of globalization and how that helps us understand uh, this reaction or the backlash. Uh, going back to, uh, to US history, um, in fact, you know, the, the, the world's uh, very first self-consciously populist movement um, was the U.S. People's Party, um, and also called Populists, uh, the Populist uh, Party at the time. And, um, and uh, the, this, this famous uh, statement by uh, the um, Democratic presidential candidate, I believe he was a candidate three times, uh, William Jennings Bryan, that's, that's actually very well known, uh, probably the, the, the most famous uh, uh, sort of piece of political oratory uh, in, in U.S. Uh, history, uh, where he uttered this famous um, uh, statement, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Um, what was he talking about? Of course, he's talking about the gold standard. The gold standard was, you know, the, you know, sort of the, the, the system that upheld the globalization of the time. And why was he and, and the other populists at the time uh, so vehemently 
that set against the gold standard because uh, they associated uh, with essentially um, uh, um, high real interest rate, tight credit conditions, um, and essentially policies that today we would call austerity policies, uh, essentially tight money. Um, and, uh, and that's why they wanted to monetize silver. They wanted to get off the gold standard and, and uh, be able to, to reflate um, in terms of, of monetary policy. And, and, and Brian and the other uh, populists uh, at the time really were representing the, the farmers um, uh, um, who had been, who had built up uh, large amounts of debt and they were feeling the, the brunt of high real interest rates and had therefore their interest in getting off gold. And if you read the whole speech, uh, the all uh, speech um, of uh, uh, Brian, it's, it's remarkably modern in terms of its complaints uh, that it could have been written um, by somebody from, you know, Podemos today, you know, complaining about Brussels or the Euro. Um, and because in, in, in many ways, uh, the syndromes of, 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 of tight money, free capital flows, and also the, the target of uh, who the culprits were. The culprits were the Northeastern uh, financiers, the banking institutions, the people who wanted the gold standard, who liked the gold standard, um, and uh, sort of taking directly, um, uh, targeting directly the upholders of the existing uh, um, uh, system of economic globalization. Um, now, um, this was this, you know, this very first uh, instance of a uh, very self-conscious um, kind of a populist movement that is so intricately um, uh, intertwined uh, with, um, uh, with 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 um, globalization. Uh, is 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 an instance of what I will later call a kind of a left wing populism, but it was, because it it revolved largely around issues of uh, finance, uh, the financial system, about sort of it revolved around issues, income, um, you know, uh, cleavages of 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 class and and, and incomes, rather than uh, what has become more common uh, today, kind of a a, a right wing uh, populism that revolves much more in, around issues of cultural, racial, uh, linguistic, or or, or kind of uh, religious kinds of cleavages, uh, but I will I will come to that a little bit uh, later. Uh, so the, the big question is is why is there um, this kind of relationship, or to put it more directly, why might globalization foster populism? Um, and I think to understand the picture, it, it, I, I find it helpful to think about both the the demand and the supply side of populism uh, separately. That on the demand for populism. Uh, that there is um, a, a lot of things that happens during the advanced stages of economic openness uh, that tends to generate uh, not just distributional implications, but a lot of uh, economic anxiety um, uh, on the part of, of large segments of the population. And I want to go through just the very simple economics of that. Um, uh, but that that on its own uh, is uh, is is insufficient because the kind of uh, you know the demand for um, uh, a political response doesn't necessarily take a very formed approach. That this this is in general a kind of a, a dispersed, inchoate uh, kind of of discontent. That it has to be provided some kind of shape, an overall narrative, an overall target. And it is the political institutions, the political leadership, political parties, uh, and the politicians who provide a particular shape uh, to these uh, the discontent. And that's, I think, where the supply side of populism comes. And I think um, the, the framing of these issues around particular societal cleavages uh, is what defines the specific form that populism takes, whether it takes a right-wing form and a left-wing form in particular. And I'll, 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 I'll come to that and have something to say about why so much of the European uh, populism today uh, is of the right-wing kind, why um, in the United States we have both, and why Latin America has been mostly left-wing, for example. So on the, uh, just going through the demand sides, and sort of where does this anxiety come from? Uh, there, here, it, it's really, um, uh, you know, very straightforwardly uh, a consequence of many of the things that, that we teach, that, that, that I learned here, as I said at the outset, that what standard economics says about um, opening up to trade is first, and of course we say this 
um, sort of, I'll, 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 I'll make three points here, and I think we emphasize the first much more than the second, and the third rarely at all, but I think they're all important. The first really is about uh, the gains from trade, that reducing barriers at the border generates uh, gains from trade in the sense that the overall consumption possibilities uh, increase. Uh, second, of course, but that not everyone wins, and I think in, in most of the models of trade, uh, um, uh, except for the Ricardian model where there is only single factor labor that's perfectly mobile across sectors, there's always some distributional effects of trade, and that these distributional in fact, in fact are not just sort of relative. I think, you know, going back to Stolper Samuelson, which was this remarkable demonstration that one factor would lose not just in relative terms, it would actually lose in absolute terms, that its real incomes would go down. Um, that uh, result is, is generalizes, in fact, to um, a much broader kind of settings. You, just, you don't need just two factors and two goods to get Stolper-Samuelson type results, that in fact, um, that, that, that as long as you know, there is imports are competing with domestic production and with the usual kind of neoclassical uh, assumptions, there's always going to be one factor at least that's going to be worse off uh, with the opening of, of trade or with the reduction of trade barriers. So these are actually quite stark. There's always at least one group that's going to be worse off uh, with the opening up uh, of, 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 of trade. Um, and, and that's, by the way, is, is, is you know, independent of the consumption basket because, you know, essentially it's a really, you know, again, going back to my graduate you know, the remarkable um, a magnification effect uh, in, in, in trade theory which says that uh, um, factor prices are going to be bracketing goods price uh, changes and therefore there's always going to be some factors that's going to lose out regardless of the consume, consumption basket. Um, so that's just to indicate that there are in fact these very stark uh, distributional effects from, from opening and I'll come back to how large these effects might be in a second. But the third point um, is uh, that these redistributive effects tend to loom larger uh, as the magnitude of the barriers we are reducing get to be smaller. Um, I think this is probably the part about openness to trade or globalization that is, that is, that, that is least um, uh, uh, taught and, and, and least uh, appreciated. But it, it's actually a very uh, direct result uh, from uh, standard public finance, which is that if you think about it, a, a tariff, uh, just like any kind of a tax, uh, the gains from reducing the tariff uh, fall disproportionately with the square of the tariff. So the, the economic gains, that is the gains from trade, uh, become disproportionately smaller as the barriers uh, that you're removing become smaller and smaller, whereas the redistributive effects are really linear in the price changes. So it doesn't matter whether the tariffs are high or low for any uh, you know, uh, proportionately similar changes in tariffs, you get uh, equivalent amounts of, of, of redistribution. So that what that means is that as the barriers get low, uh, the amount of redistribution you're doing uh, for any kind of net gains or for any kind of gains from trade that you generate get to be larger and larger. So what that means in practical terms is that trade agreements start to look more and more redistributive uh, to a first order uh, rather than uh, essentially increasing the overall, um, uh, uh, overall production possibilities or generating net gains from trade. And I think that's, that's partly, I think, helps to explain uh, the, the why trade agreements become politically more contentious in the advanced stages of globalization because we are going after barriers that tend to be lower. So I think the trade agreements of the after the 1990s are very different in that respect from the early GATT rounds of the um, the 50s or the 60s. Um, so I said, you know, I said I would say something a, lo a little bit about sort of the magnitude of these redistributive effects. Um, and they're very large. So if you work with the kind of standard workhorse models of trade that we teach in, in the classroom, uh, that, that you get very large amounts of redistribution uh, in relation to the net gains from trade. So if you just take a standard, for example, uh, either a partial equilibrium model or a standard two-factor general equilibrium model, that what you will get is that 
you know, at, at levels of tariffs that are at current levels, uh, that you would get um, something like um, re reshuffle uh, $10 of income uh, for $1 of, of, of net gain that, that you're generating. So these distributive effects are actually quite large. Um, this point, um, I think, was recently made in, in, in a paper by um, uh, uh, Paul uh, Antras de Gortari and also uh, Oleg here, um, who sort of take these distributional effects uh, into account and show that, in fact, uh, they would, um, uh, taking this into account, would eat substantial amount of the overall gains from trade if you take these into account. There's also, just, just before lunch, a very nice paper, a new paper by um, uh, um, Andres uh, Rodriguez Clare, uh, um, which uh, shows that in fact um, uh, the the kind of redistributive effects that you get are um, you know sort of um, quite large relative to the overall gains um, that uh, um, and 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 in this paper that was about um, doing the, the China uh, the China shock of course you know which is a well known paper. There's another paper on NAFTA by. Uh, Hakobian and McLaren that shows uh, relatively um, large um, uh, effects at the level of, of uh, sort of, you know, s when you dif sp spatially uh, differentiate labor markets, uh, where I think uh, it turns out that it's a very important margin uh, for looking at distributional effects, um, uh, uh, spatial labor markets. Uh, so, so, you know, this is all follows naturally and directly from the, 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 the standard theory that that we teach. Um, so in that sense, you know, it should not have been a surprise. So it is, you know, you know, you can you can look at this one of two ways. You can say either so we should have known because this is exactly what we teach. This comes directly from our trade. We should know that there are going to be very stark distributional effects. Alternatively, you can say we're responsible <laughs> because that's what we wanted and that's that that's 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 what we happen. There's another aspect of of um, sort of this, the the basic economics of globalization. Um, which I think is important, and I think this has become perhaps wasn't as as important um, because you know it, it's not as standard in our teaching as as the as trade theory. Uh, but I think a, a significant feature of our the current phase of globalization that is that it, in, it entails a significant asymmetry. Uh, between who is mobile internationally and who is not. So to put it very starkly, uh, capital is internationally mobile and labor is not. Um, you see this, of course, both in terms of uh, um, in, f in, in foreign direct investment, um, but also you see it um, in, in terms of um, financial globalization, that this asymmetry between who can move and who cannot. Um, and I think that has very distinct um, uh, economic implication again just follows uh, very straightforwardly from you know, basic uh, economic principles that what that means is that the uh, differential mobility means that that the de demand for labor becomes more elastic uh, as capital is able to move and that has a, that has a specific number of Im implications um, for it has implications for the distribution of the surplus to the extent that uh, there is any bargaining element uh, involved in in weight setting uh, that means that uh, labor's uh, share of the surplus or the labor uh, um, uh, uh, income tends to, would tends to go down it has Im impacts for the incidence of shocks that is that who bears the cost of shocks to the extent that capital can move around and labor is stuck. Uh, it implies it implies a much greater incidence uh, of uh, exogenous shocks on, on on labor, and of course it it has direct impact on who bears the cost of taxes. Um, that that taxes will have to be borne uh, more by the the fixed um, uh, factor of production rather than the one that is mobile, and many of these uh, elements uh, I think are now increasingly. Uh, uh, being observed uh, in the data, there is some remarkable work that that economists at the IMF of all places um, uh, um, have done, looking at the effects of um, the opening up of capital accounts on income distribution, and these are some rather sort of you know, dramatic uh, and and stark uh, empirical findings. Uh, that, that regardless of whether you look at the share of labor uh, in total national income, you look at the top 1% uh, uh, share of incomes, the top 5%, top 
or the Gini coefficient, although that is not shown here, that there is in fact um, a very significant uh, downward effect on, uh, or on the labor share or upward effect on inequality. Um, uh, 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 you know, um, as 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 uh, economies open up uh, to to capital flows, and with respect to taxation, of course, it's it's, it's well known uh, that uh, that uh, it's it's one of the areas, it's probably the only area where we've seen a very clear uh, global uh, competition or race to the bottom, where corporate tax rates uh, have gone down. Of course, everybody here will. Remember that, that 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 one of the key motivations for reducing corporate tax tax rates uh, in the United States uh, was that the United States had to uh, compete with other countries with lower corporate tax rates, um, and um, and 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 you see uh, um, in in Europe especially that the tax um, base, the tax incidence has has moved uh, quite significantly away from from capital uh, to labor, and particularly in the form of the uh, the, the VAT. Um, now, uh, it, it, the, the the kind of um, again going back to the classroom when we teach these distributional effects, what we emphasize is that that in principle. Um, uh, you could um, uh, make uh, everybody better off by compensating, by redistributing uh, adequately. Now, uh, it turns out that um, at current levels of trade barriers, uh, I also already mentioned that the, that the redistributive effects are so large uh, that it's, it's not, and actually it may not be physically possible to compensate the losers uh, even with moderate amounts uh, of excess burden of taxation because in other words in order to redistribute income uh, even if you could identify the losers uh, you'll need to tax uh, the, the winners and and with moderate amounts of uh, excess burden of taxation uh, you could um, you would you know you would eat um, uh, most of the gains from trade just in the efficiency cost of the taxation uh, required to redistribute uh, but if we leave that aside uh, it is clear that that in Europe for example compensation has played a very significant role uh, in enabling uh, a much higher levels of openness to trade compared to the United States Europe has always been much more open to trade um, and to this day uh, in Europe for example trade with low-income countries is not a political issue it's not that people don't complain about globalization in Europe but they complain about other things about globalization about the rules about investor investor rights or about financial globalization or Brussels and the euro but trade with Mexico or China is not an issue. And I think in large part it's not because uh, the welfare states have been so much stronger uh, in, in Europe and therefore has taken the edge off of many of these directly redistributive effects of trading with low-income countries. Um, and in, in Europe, uh, indeed, there is a very close connection between how exposed an economy is to trade and the generosity or the extensiveness of its welfare state. And that's sometimes I say that the welfare state has been the flip side of the open economy. And that's very clear in the context of Europe. Um, but uh, in the United States, uh, which became uh, much more open in the 1990s and in, in the 2000s, uh, NAFTA and then uh, WTO and subsequently the entry of China into um, uh, um, uh, into the WTO, uh, in principle, the United States could have gone uh, the the path uh, of Europe, uh, but of course it didn't, and it went, if anything, in the other direction, because the 1990s and 2000s were, in fact, when people were, uh, for for ideological reasons, the movement was away from uh, the welfare state. So in, in the United States, uh, the response. The compensation response was, in fact, very, very meager. It took the form largely of these cosmetic uh, trade adjustment assistance um, uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, which we now know actually don't work. Uh, and there's a good reason they don't work, because they're, they're the typical kind of time inconsistent policies, which is that you promise the you know, compensation to labor unions uh, when you're negotiating these trade agreements. But once trade agreements are negotiated, you actually have no incentive to really truly fund uh, these programs after the fact or to make them work. Uh, and, 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 and they have not worked. Um, and in, in addition, of course, um, uh, this, uh, this, this differential mobility 
uh, between capital and labor also means that the whole point about social insurance through a well welfare state uh, becomes unsustainable because you are no longer able to tax capital in order to fund your social insurance programs. So in the advanced stages of globalization, this bargain, which worked for a number of decades in Europe, which is um, an extensive social welfare state in response, in return for the open economy, that bargain becomes unsustainable uh, since if, if you cannot uh, tax um, uh, uh, capital and as, as the tax base increasingly shifts towards um, uh, consumption. Um, so I think to a large extent, and I think in the, in the sort of the, the advanced stages of, of globalization, the result is that you have this, this unraveling of the bargain and you get greater economic insecurity in the, in the, in the context of, of weaker rather than um, uh, uh, stronger safety nets. Um, uh, on the demand side, the final thing I, I want to just mention, uh, I think, is, is to go a little bit beyond economics and also to... Um, to make us think a little bit that 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 uh, that some of this uh, backlash is really not necessarily about the cleavages or the divisions that are created in terms of incomes, but uh, divisions or cle cleavages that are created in terms of other aspects of of well-being. Um, that is, in other words, it's not simply about incomes. Uh, when we think about why is it that globalization raises or become politically so salient compared to so many other shocks, which may in fact become you know, quantitatively more important in terms of creating labor market, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, labor market uh, adjustment problems, uh, technological shocks, uh, demand shocks. Why is it that globalization becomes um, uh, so much more contentious? Well, one answer perhaps is that with globalization, you have a foreigner you can point to. But I think another answer is that globalization is different from either demand shocks or te technological shocks domestically in so far as it tends to, fo to force competition under ground rules uh, that are often very different and even may have been prohibited at home. That is to say, every market is embedded in a kind of a set of rules about what's a fair exchange um, uh, and, and what kind of exchanges are allowed, what kind of exchanges are not allowed. And I think the importance of those rules are to ensure that if I'm losing my jobs, if, I'm, if, if I have an adverse effect, that I know that at least we were all, co all competing under the same ground rules. Um, and that um, that that you know that you know somebody worked harder, somebody came up with a better product, uh, somebody invested more than I did, and that's why they got ahead, and that's why you know maybe um, I'm coming under competitive pressure or I might be losing my my job. It's very different uh, when that kind of competitive uh, pressure is created not by somebody working harder or coming up with a better product, but because somebody is exploiting labor, harming the environment, or subsidized, being subsidized by their governments elsewhere. And that feels uh, intuitively uh, like a very different kind of competition. Uh, than the domestic kind of competition, um, which uh, often operates within um, within uh, sort of you know normative um, uh, uh, rules that that seem to satisfy domestic understandings of procedural fairness or distributive ju uh, distributive justice. So I think there are some legitimate concerns that competition. Uh, among, uh, uh, you know, between very different jurisdictions with very different uh, rules and regulations uh, um, uh, creates in terms of the levelness of, of playing fields and, and of underlying fairness of trade. Nice quote here from a, 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 a uh, Pierre Rizon Vallon that I, that I like, which is that the problem is not inequality per se, but that inequality that is felt to be unfair. That is, inequality is felt most acutely when citizens believe that the rules apply differently to different people. Uh, so I think that's the sense that 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 overlay um, of um, uh, of unfairness is I think um, what what makes um, some of the effects of of globalization um, uh, magnified and felt so much more, and and I think you know one issue that I point out here about this this division in societies between groups and people who feel that their fates are tied with global networks because either they have the ability or the resources or the skills to take part in these global networks, the so-called cosmopolitans or 
um, you know, uh, sometimes they're called the, the anywheres, people who could prosper anywhere, so that's, you know, that's basically most of us here, versus those who don't have the resources or the networks or the, the assets um, to, 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 uh, to prosper, who, who feel themselves they're really stuck there. You, know, you might call them the communitarians or, or, the, or the somewheres. Um, and, and that division, that social distance between these two groups, uh, is magnified by the uh, forces of globalization, by the ability of those who are mobile to take advantage of these networks. And even if it doesn't show up uh, as greater inequality in terms of income terms, uh, it shows up as a greater social uh, and political divisions in societies. And I think that's one explanation why in many continental European countries, even though income inequality hasn't increased as it has in the United States, you still have many of the same pressures because the social distance uh, between the uh, cosmopolitans and the communitarians um, ha has, um, has been uh, um, uh, uh, increased by the forces of economic globalization. So now, uh, just um, let me briefly turn uh, to, to, the, to the supply side. Uh, and one way to motivate the supply side is by posing the puzzle, why does globalization take, why, I'm sorry, why does pop, the populism uh, take uh, so many different forms? Um, and the main difference that, that I'm interested in is what I'll call the left-wing versus the right-wing variants uh, of, of populism. Um, the original populism, which I mentioned at the outset of my talk, the one that goes to the U.S. People's Party, or William Jennings Bryan, was very much a left-wing populism. Uh, it's a populism that revolves around issues of bread and butter, that is, that incomes, and takes as its target uh, financial institutions um, and, um, and, and, the, and, the, and the financial elites. Um, uh, that kind of populism has been common throughout history. In fact, it is the predominant kind of populism that Latin America, which is with this very long and rich tradition of populism, long before populism became you know, the mot du jour uh, in Europe, uh, you know, was very well known uh, in, in Latin America. And if you look at sort of the, the, the right-hand panel there, which shows the, you know, the, the two kinds of populism, uh, left-wing versus right-wing, um, uh, basically, Latin America knows very little uh, right-wing kind of populism. Almost all of it has been of the left-wing variety um, and uh, has been around for a very long time. Uh, it's in Europe that if you look at the, the, the recent rise in populism, is almost um, exclusively has been of the, um, of the right-wing variety. Um, I think left-wing populism is relatively rare. I think probably you know Syriza in 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 Greece and and uh, Podemos in Spain would be their main sort of you know examples of left wing populism, but pretty much, you know sort of the main populist movements in Sweden, Denmark, France, Austria, um, uh, uh, Germany um, essentially are of the of the right wing uh, variety. So how do we how do we think about that? So I think here's, I think where distinguishing the demand and the supply side, uh, I think, uh, makes some sense. That the demand side creates uh, um, anxiety, discontent, demand for political action, but doesn't necessarily come well formed. Uh, it doesn't come with a particular story. It doesn't come with a narrative. It doesn't come with a set of solutions. And the solutions and the narrative and the framing has to be provided uh, by political institutions, by political leaders, by political parties. And populist politicians can mobilize support, provide a narrative or a frame uh, by exploiting one of two kinds of cleavages. Uh, one type of cleavage uh, is a kind of a, a cultural cleavage. It's an it's a ethno-national, linguistic, uh, religious, or racial cleavage uh, that defines the people as people who look like us, who have the same cultural background. And the enemies of the people, or the others, or the elites, or, the, or, or, or are the ones who are on the other side of that ethno-national cleavage. Um, so that's one particular framing uh, of um, sort of you know, th this, this, this problem in terms of who the people is, uh, and uh, you know, what needs to be done, or what is the, 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 the main uh, uh, the target. But the other one uh, is the one that is, revolves largely around economic issues, is, is the one about income and social uh, uh, class. Um, and I think depending on which kind of cleavage uh, 
pol populist politicians uh, um, exploit, you can then have a you know, right-wing or, or a left-wing kind of populism. So the interesting question is, is, is what then in turn determines which one of these cleavages uh, will be uh, the ones. And I think the, the immediate, um, the, the, the proximate answer to that is, is going to be sort of which is the cleavage that is the more salient at any point in time, which is the one that's more readily mobilizable. So I think it's easier to mobilize uh, along the, the kind of cultural or the ethno-national cleavage uh, when in the eyes of the ordinary people, in, in terms of the everyday experience of people, uh, the kind of uh, the shock uh, takes uh, the form mainly of, of immigrants or refugees or people who sort of look different. And I think that has been a dominant factor uh, in, 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 in Europe. And I think it's, it's easier to mobilize along the income or the social class cleavage uh, when glo the globalization shock takes the form mainly of uh, shocks to trade, foreign investment, financial crisis. And that, that has been the, the largely the, uh, the dominant form uh, in Latin America, of course, in the context of the debt crisis, in the context of the Washington Consensus in the context of the IMF and the World Bank conditionality, or for that matter in Spain or Greece, which have had, of course, their version of financial globalization and financial crisis have been the policies of Brussels and Troika uh, or, or the Euro crisis. Interestingly, the United States is a bit of both, uh, that you have uh, the trade shock, the China trade shock, NAFTA politically uh, um, a very salient, um, uh, and you also have uh, visible, visibly uh, an, an immigration um, uh, issue. And I think sort of, you know, in the fact that in 2016 we saw both a right-wing uh, populism, populist in my term, Donald Trump, and a left-wing populist by my term, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, I think uh, is, in fact, you know, this is very, one of the few cases I can think of where you had simultaneously uh, both kinds of, 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 um, of, of populists. And I think that has to do with the, the multitude that the that that there were there were uh, uh, both types of of, of cleavages uh, had certain political salience uh, in the United States, with respect to migration, I think it's it's or the immigrants is actually quite interesting. Uh, there's been more uh, rigorous work on this, but I think just one one table um, I think summarizes the picture quite interesting. Just comparing France and Spain, uh, that. Uh, both countries have actually comparable number of immigrants relative to native population. In fact, uh, Spain has a little bit higher uh, in terms of the uh, immigrants relative to native population. Uh, but the big difference uh, is, you know, where do these immigrants coming from? Uh, the, the dominant groups of immigrants in Spain are those who come from uh, Latin America, um, and of course, the immigrants from Latin America have the same religion, speak the same language, look pretty much uh, the same as, as the natives. Um, uh, whereas in, in France, uh, the largest groups are really coming from the, the Muslim countries or Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, different religious and cultural practices uh, um, often look uh, visibly different. So I think that has uh, a lot to do with the fact that that, that has been uh, a cleavage that, that has been uh, much easier uh, to exploit on the part of, of, of politicians. The whole point about the, you know, the, the uh, distinction between the demand and the supply side is also a way of getting at this debate, particularly in the United States, about whether populism is really about incomes or income inequality or where it's really about culture. And I and in the United States, it has been a dominant uh, uh, explanation that it's really about race and culture and, 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 uh, and this particular sort of the racial divide uh, in the United States, that, that the election of Trump is a kind of, you know, sort of, you know, white middle class, you know, expression of, of uh, essentially a deep underlying racial divide. Now, I don't want to at all minimize the importance of the racial divide in the United States, but it seems to me that, 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 that populism is, is, is such a global phenomenon that is happening in so many different countries. It's very difficult to attribute the United, the, 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 its, its version in the United States uh, simply to a phenomenon that's so specific to the United States. So I prefer to have you know, this, this explanation that sort of says, 
says that, that on the demand side, there are sort of very common shocks, common processes linked, not exclusively, but, uh, but uh, um, you know, but, but globalization being one of the most sort of uh, visible forms of these um, underlying economic shocks that in turn get framed uh, around different kinds of, of, of cleavages depending on, on local conditions. So the supply side matters a lot in giving shape to these things. So let me just, let me just end uh, by uh, sort of you know, my, my plea to economists uh, about um, uh, uh, you know, how do we think about, about populism and what's happening uh, today. Um, you know, sometimes you know, uh, the, you know, one way to think about it is, is, is to, 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 to say that, 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 that we need to distinguish between different types of populism. Again, let me go back to the um, uh, uh, to um, to Brian and the U.S. Uh, People's Party. At the time, they were clearly populist. At the time, they were out of the uh, mainstream. But many of their ideas became eventually part of the mainstream because the business regulation uh, going out of the gold standard. Of course, that was a crazy idea at the time. Now we think sort of you know, you know, you have to be really sort of crazy like the Europeans to go on, the, on, a, on a gold standard. Um, but um, uh, so th all those you know, crazy populist ideas eventually became quite mainstream. And in many ways, I think you know, the US populism culminated in the New Deal, uh, which was uh, populism. Uh, FDR was you know, viewed as a populist at the time. Um, uh, but so it, it's important to understand sort of what are the circumstances under which some of this reaction to the uh, prevailing economic mainstream is justified. Um, and I think, um, you know, we as economists tend to um, favor, uh, you know, um, kind of, of um, disciplines and restraints uh, on, uh, on economic policy because we tend to have in the back of our mind this notion that there is the main distortion to political decision-making is a kind of uh, dynamic inconsistency that politicians left to themselves uh, will do things that harm uh, the economy because of this time inconsistency, whether it's because of you know, high inflation or because of you know, the log rolling of tariffs and, and, and falling into this protectionist uh, um, uh, uh, traps. And therefore, we view this sort of you know, uh, restrictions on populist economic policies by delegating policy either to independent agencies, independent central banks, or, 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 or trade agreements as a way of preventing politicians, political systems from harming themselves. And that's perfectly justifiable. But this is not the only set of circumstances under which such delegation takes place. Delegation can only also take place for purely redistributive purposes when particular groups, interests, uh, lobbies, pharmaceutical companies, multinational companies, or investors, financial institutions, capture the political process and are able to come up with uh, design policies. And in this way, what they're doing is not uh, institu instituting restraints uh, to protect themselves against their future self, as in the t traditional time inconsistency problem, but they're instituting restraints to protect themselves against future majorities. In other words, in this case, the restraints are purely redistributive rather than uh, safeguarding the interests of the majority. So in that second case, I think the kind of, of um, uh, restraints that we associate with technocracy or with, with restraints, uh, with delegation, are, are much, much uh, less uh, desirable. And I think um, when you, th you, you think about the good type of economic populism, the one that goes back to Amer U.S.'s own history, um, uh, again, culminating with, with the New Deal, I think what that kind of populism did was, in fact, uh, forestall uh, the much more uh, damaging version of, of, of populism, which is the political populism that comes with the uh, disregard for norms of, of plural, pluralism and, 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 and liberal democracy. And, and, do, and that's really the, the hard kind. And I think in the same way that the FDR um, uh, forestalled the much more extremist voices uh, at the time in the 1930s. Uh, we might want to think about whether there are sort of ways of undertaking economic reforms uh, that will perhaps go against some of our existing sacred cows, whether they are 
uh, international trade agreements or whether they are um, a delegation to techn technocratic uh, regulatory agencies, um, which might serve the same purpose uh, in today's um, uh, kind of crisis that we're experiencing. So thank you for your patience and, and, and let me just let me stop here. Thanks, Danny. So we have, um, we'll stay in this room. The so next session will seamlessly move on. Um, we have 10 to 15 uh, minutes for question and answers. I'm sure there are many. So we'll take questions and then Danny can respond to those. Yes. Thank you very much. I have two questions. One, it's on the U.S. tax policy in your uh, slides. Now it's coming down to 22% from your 40% there. Now, fact, uh, putting this back into your redistribution, it seems that um, the net effect, at least in the near term, is going to make everything even worse. And my second question that you sh mentioned, the problem is the worldwide event. Can you explain why it's not happening in China or it's just happening there? we don't know it? Yes, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, recent, uh, the, the, the recent uh, tax policies, you're absolutely right. And I think it's, it's um, um, it, you know, it, 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 it's one of these things that makes it very hard to take um, uh, President Trump's claim that he speaks for, that he's really a populist and he speaks for a popular base, it makes that claim very difficult to accept uh, precisely because it's redistributive in the, in the, in the wrong direction. So I, I agree uh, exactly with what you said. There's an interesting, so the question about um, uh, um, China, or for that matter, with a lot of other developing countries, which paradoxically perhaps have now become the defenders of, of globalization. Um, it, it's an interesting question. The, 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 the proximate answer for that is, I think, is that, that, that uh, China is still doing relatively very well. So um, whatever underlying problems there might be, I think they are hidden uh, from sight uh, uh, when the economy tends to be doing very well. So I think you know, the, the populism uh, is, is very clearly... Um, uh, uh, the timing of emergence of populism is very clearly linked with the business cycle. So one of the reasons that the U.S. populists eventually did not go anywhere uh, is because there were gold discoveries in South Africa and some uh, and other places in the 1890s, and suddenly, uh, you know, the the, the pr you know the, the you know the price of, of of gold fell and the price of commodities rose, and then the immediate uh, uh, hardships were alleviated, and that took the edge off of the um, of the the populist uh, demand for getting off the off the gold standard and other reforms. So, uh, so I think my answer is that that that. Um, in the case of China and potentially many other developing countries, uh, if and when growth uh, slows down, uh, many of these issues are going to uh, be present in, in, in developing countries as well. And, and with respect to China in particular, uh, it, you know, it, it, that would require longer discussion. But I think China has been a beneficiary of the system in so far as, as China has been able to play the globalization game very much by its own rules. So it's, 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 you know, it has had a very mixed um, uh, uh, strategy of uh, selectively protecting its economy uh, through various trade and industrial policies, selectively protecting its financial system with capital controls and other financial regulations, um, entering the, the, the World Trade Organization only after it had, you know, undertaken significant amount of, of structural transformation and diversification using policies that it would not have been able to pursue had it been a member of the WTO earlier. So also in many ways that, you know, China has been able to, to have globalization cake, the globalization cake and eat it too. Um, and I think in that way, you know, the, these constraints have not necessarily 
uh, uh, have not bid as much uh, for China as it has in many other countries. Good question. Um, Danny, may I suggest we take a few questions so maybe, maybe in the yeah. interest of time? Uh, it's a lady here, yep. Hi, my name is Anna Chum. I'm a student at Princeton University. Thank you so much for your um, talk. So even with the current debate on globalization and trade, African countries are actually moving towards more integration and freer trade. Um, for the past two years, well, over two years, they've been negotiating a free trade area that would cover 55, the 55 recognized states of the continent. And most of the analysis I've read from Brookings, Belfer, AFDB have been largely optimistic about this free trade area for standard economic reasons, but also ideo ideo ideologically, because some see this as Africa's pushback against the existing global order. I was wondering if you could share your thoughts, maybe cautionary messages, or if you're feeling up to it, some prophecies on what <laughs> this might turn out to look like if it's passed, which it might very well be um, passed in March of this year. We'll, we'll take a couple of more questions. My question goes to your statement about capital is mobile, labor is immobile. After 9-11, uh, the US uh, federal regulations changed in terms of foreign investment, and I'm wondering if that in any way crippled our country from in terms of growth. One more. things you do is to get us all to think that what we look at in the U.S. isn't just happening here. The same kinds of things are happening elsewhere, and therefore we need to look at global forces. But globalization is not the only global force that's operating in the world today. When all these societies are aging, and that probably changes the mix between anywheres and somewheres, and has other effects on how people think politically. And the other is, now, for a very long time, and right through the China shock, the U.S., and it's probably true in Europe too, uh, manufacturing job loss has been much greater owing to uh, technical change than it has been to uh, trade. And I was wondering if you could comment on these other global forces and how they fit into your ways, the way you see the world. Yeah, um, thank you. Maybe uh, just going backwards, I think, you know, Jeff, you're, you're absolutely right that globalization uh, is not the only thing. And I think uh, I, I've given short shrift to, to many other things, in particular deindustrialization and technological change uh, that, has, that, has, that has played a role. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, de-emphasize the role of those other things. Uh, but as I, as I said, uh, in my comments in, in passing, there is something about globalization that um, takes on political significance and political salience uh, that seems outsized, uh, even uh, when you compare to the effects of you know many of these things that you mentioned. For example, that that you know we can agree that technological change has been a bigger factor pushing for deindustrialization and dislocation of workers uh, than, than globalization has. Uh, but, uh, but, but it is globalization that gets to blame. And I think, you know, um, you know I view part of what I'm trying to, try to, trying to do uh, is um, without necessarily, you know, um, uh, uh, exaggerating the problems that that globalization poses. Let's understand the core of the problem so that that we would be in a far better position to address the unease that globalization creates if we are able to respond to what I would call legitimate grievances about globalization rather than simply uh, uh, you know sort of ruling them as you know outside uh, you know legitimate discussion as, as I think we often have done when it comes to questions like social dumping or questions about the uh, uh, you know asymmetric mobility or or um, uh, or, or, or downward um, uh, um, uh, uh, race to the bottom in taxation and so forth. So, um, so I think you know my my focus here was largely on globalization. I don't want to to um, 
to de-emphasize those other things. Uh, with respect to U.S. FDI regulation, I, I, I'm really not quite sure. Sort of, you know, I, I you know, uh, I would need to to ask you what more you have in mind about that. So I, I don't have any specific comment. And and on Africa, uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, you know, the. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing if there's significantly greater regional integration in trade in, in, in Africa, because each one of these countries are so small uh, that anything they can do to reduce what are effectively inordinate, inordinate trade costs in terms of logistics, transport, other bureaucratic hurdles, that that would have to be on its own a good thing. Where um, I get concerned uh, is if you know is is if Africa starts repeating the mistakes that many other developing countries made, uh, looking at globalization as if it's it, it's their their sole development strategy that it becomes this is how we develop, um, and I think we, there was a question about China. The, the great thing about China is that basically, you know, China used globalization. Uh, as a way to to leverage uh, it, its um, its economy, and, uh, and 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 globalization was coupled with a domestic strategy of economic transformation, diversification, very concerted policies directed at at at, at promoting domestic industries um, uh, aside from uh, its globalization policy. So I think all successful countries sort of need to to do those things, the internal work alongside the external work, and if you just focus, as I think many Latin American countries did in the 1990s, uh, simply focus on, you know, trade agreements or, or, or globalization as, you know, what's going to save you, what's going to give, give, give you growth uh, without uh, undertaking the domestic investment strategies alongside, uh, I think then that becomes disappointing. And I think that becomes, then you, you set yourself up for, for a backlash, in fact, against those agreements. Thank you uh, very much, Danny. Um, we would love to go on, but we have to move on to the next session. So thank you again.